Thanks a lot. Uh, first, I want to thank the organizers for the great job they have done here. It's a fantastic job, fantastic setup. Thanks a lot for inviting me. Um, I represent, represent the Danish Patient Association, HPV Vaccine Victims. And I am, like many others here, a father to an injured girl. I fully believe the health agency's recommendations until 2013, where I realized why my daughter was sick for two years. I'm chairman of the group against HPV vaccine victims. Am I pro or con vaccines? Well, personally, I'm fully vaccinated. My son and my daughter, they are fully vaccinated. So we can't be called anti-vaxxers, as the trolls do in Denmark as well, as they do in Ireland. Uh, we stopped that, actually, because we had a huge freedom of information, and we could see that the trolls was actually cooperating with the health agency. So when we disclosed that, we had kind of six months of uh, pause from them. Very embarrassing, very embarrassing. So in general, what is behind our trust or our doubt in vaccines? How does anyone become anti-vaccines? What, what do we know when we get a vaccine? How much work do we do to investigate? What is the benefit? What is the efficacy? What is the risk? Well, I didn't do much. I trusted the doctor. I trusted the health agency. I trusted my colleagues that said, if you go to Asia, you need Hep A or whatever it was. I just got the shot here. But what is it really? It's marketing. I don't know. Not Probably not many of you remember that one. But it was quite popular. And if you dig into that, you actually have a very clear parallel to what is going on in the vaccine industry. Because the man on the picture, he's not a doctor. He's an actor. Okay? So they have a statement on top. <laughs> what cigarette would the doctor recommend? Well, nobody told that the doctor would recommend any cigarette at all. But then they made a statistic here that more doctors smoke camels than any other cigarette. So they manipulate information down here to say, oh, doctors recommend that you smoke which absolutely is not the case, and not even at that time. This is what's going on with the vaccine industry right now. They're manipulating the information, so we don't get a clear picture. So the reason for being in this uh, organization here is that in 2011, my daughter started to faint, to get headache, uh, brain fog, blurred vision, blurred hearing, uh, paralyzed from hips and down, fainting, you know, you know them, actually. I heard them earlier today. She was force active. Actually, in February 11, she was examined by a doctor with specialty in diving. And that means she was examined for heart, for lungs, for pulse, blood pressure, everything. Everything was normal at that time. Then, less than half a year later, everything was absolutely abnormal. Heart rate blood pressure, everything was going up and down, and caused fainting. So for three years, she had 70% absence from school. Being a teenager, not going to school, not socializing with anyone, that, that's really, really hard. So from 2011 to 2013, we were like the guest of the week at the University Hospital. When she fainted in the traffic, people called an ambulance and she was into the hospital. And then she called from them, hey, somebody called here, what do I do? I'm in the ambulance now. And she got used to that. Because when you faint everywhere in, in the environment, people help you, luckily. So then in 2013, some friends called us and said, hey, we saw an article in the newspaper. What your daughter is suffering from is actually not, uh, not a normal. There are a lot of girls with the same symptoms. So then we realized it must have been the vaccine that did the harm. So we went to our GP and he said, well, most likely. So I already reported it as a side effect. And then he was kind of end of discussion. And we said, what, what, what can we do with that? I mean, what, would she be that for the rest of her life? Well, you can't drag it out. So we left his office with that message. So what is behind the information about vaccines? 
Well, I already indicated that I don't really believe that is pure science. So somebody is telling us something and they are hiding a lot. So we don't know what the risk is when we get the jab. We don't get the product information handed out when we get the vaccine. Uh, we don't know what the risk is yet. So, so how can anyone say the risk-benefit ratio is okay? Who's actually deciding that? The doctor? No. The health agency? No. Who is it then? It's the manufacturer. There's no control, there's no standard pr procedure to approve vaccines. It's all decided by the manufacturer. And at the same time, the manufacturer don't have any uh, liability for its product. That's scary. So I'll take a little background from the uh, from the information here in public information from EMA, FDA, and the Danish Health Agency here. The rate of reporting serious adverse events in Denmark is 0.2%. Doctors expect that this is less than 10% that is reported. The risk of dying from cervical cancer before the age of 75 is actually 0.2%. Okay, but then let's eliminate that risk by getting the vaccine. But the only problem is the study proves that the vaccine efficacy is a little less, 23.9%. So we reduce the risk dying of cervical cancer before the age of 75, from 0.2 to 0.15. What is the risk ratio here? So these are numbers. Uh, okay. These are numbers. Uh, where you see the upper line is incidence, and the blue line, the lower one, is death of cervical cancer. It's all women on all ages from 1960 to 2014. So what is interesting to see is actually what that happens here in 2000. It seems like the curve is flattening out. In 2002, we actually started clinical trials with Gardasil. I will close <laughs> Can I use this one? Okay, so in 2002, we started clinical trials with Gardasil. It may be a coincidence, but still it's strange. Then it took out only girls that probably got the vaccine. So this is the age from 10 to 29. That's the spectrum I could get from, uh, from the Nordic Cancer Association here. So what is happening now is from 2000, 2015, the incidence rate is actually increasing. We have 600,000 persons vaccinated in that age group, and we don't see any change yet whatsoever. Actually, we see an increase. And that's without taking into calculation here that, again, this is from the FDA homepage. Very often when I, when I present something and say it's from the FDA homepage, they've, they changed the document's location. So then, next time I use it, the link is broken, I send a nice email to uh, the FDA, and they send a nice email back, oh, this is a new location. I wonder why. Well, what happens here is actually that the efficacy rate is negative. If you have HPV virus in the body at the time of vaccination, the vaccine-related virus types, then you will have an increased risk 44% of developing cervical cancer. Who told you that? Who tested if you had uh, any HPV virus at the time you got vaccinated? No one. And then next is just stop here. So when you are vaccinated with a vaccine that protects you against two of the high-risk types, that's what in both Cervix and Gardasil, it's two high-risk types, you actually become more prevalent to have high risk of non vaccine types. So the benefit is hard to justify now. 
Again, this is from the FDA's homepage. This is actually what they discovered during the clinical trials. New medical condition after month seven. There's a lot of them. And if you go into reproductive disorders, that's fifteen percent. Fifteen percent. Well, that's normal, or is it? This again is actually verified in a study in the U.S. where they are looking at different symptoms, diseases, in people that are vaccinated compared to people that are unvaccinated. And what you see here is that ovarian damage is 14 times higher in the group that received HPV vaccine compared to those who didn't. You have, you have a link to the, uh, to the study here. Saline placebo is not placebo. Saline placebo is not saline. Saline, sorry, in this case. So what does that mean? It really means that even the Danish sales agencies say, okay, we have a very small group that received saline placebo. Only like 590 something. But when they reference to the source for that, they reference to this study here, you have a link at the bottom. They say that the saline placebo is exactly the same as the vaccine, just without the virus and now without the aluminium. And this is confirmed by the Australian authorities here. There is no saline placebo group whatsoever. Not a single person received saline placebo. So what they do here, I mean, if it was a car manufacturer that said, well, I didn't, I didn't actually check the brakes on my car, they would most likely redraw this uh, approval. But here they say, okay, we will just ask the manufacturer to change the text in the product inlet at the next revision. So we now have a vaccine that doesn't have any placebo group for safety. This is the, the official uh, product image from the EMA homepage. You have 12 organ groups out here. And out of these 12, this very well tested, very safe vaccine, seven of these, they actually don't know the frequency. It's, it's completely insane. Take it back to the car industry again. Did you take brakes? No. Nope. Did you take uh, test the, the wipers? No. Did you test the engine if it can start? No. But I'm still approved and it's still safe. It's, it's completely uh, insane. And if you look at what it is here, you have actually <coughs> brain inflammation, inflammation in the central nervous system, syncope, uh, yeah, a lot of serious symptoms here. And we just don't know and don't want. But we have given like millions of doses all over the world, so we know it's safe. Well, let's see the evidence for that. <coughs> and then finally, just to, to put it the last on the top here, how long is the protection? Well, when we went from a three-year study, three-dose study, a three-dose program to a two-dose program. We saw that the levels of reaction was lower than after three dose. That means that 248 something is reduced to 82 something after three years. For a three dose program, this was around 900. But do we know what it is? No, but no, because these units is mini merc units, and we don't know what level we should have to be protected. So that means we don't know if we have a, a speedo speedometer in the car that has millimerc units as reference. We don't know when we exceed the speed limits. So they don't know what the level should be here before you protect it or not protect it anymore. So what they write is, oh, we really don't know what that means. So what we see now is 
from another study that say, okay, if you, if you do look at the literature in the history, the last six decades, we know that there's a lot of factors that influence the reaction to medicines. So each person reacts individually. This is stated clearly here. Age, genetics, uh, nutrition, health status, uh, environmental exposure, you can hear here. So that means we must actually figure out what is the body we are looking at needed to get any reaction here. So that's why we have different medicine. But when it comes to vaccines, how does the manufacturers take that into account? Well, they don't. There. One vaccine fits all. No matter where in the world you are, no matter what size you are, no matter how old you are, no matter what race you are, no matter what your previous uh, conditions are, one size fits all. And per definition, it's the same. So the risk is not only that we re reduce the efficacy, the risk is also that we harm our children. Again, that, that, that factor increase even worse because the manufacturers is not liable for the products. They have no responsibility. Take that to the car industry once again. When you have cars running on the highway, the brakes doesn't work. The car, the car manufacturer just says, oh, I can't help it, it's not my responsibility. Would we accept that? Not at all. Okay, so since we have a little update from Denmark here as well, we have 2,563 persons that reported 23,494 symptoms, including two deaths. Half of these is approximately <coughs> classified as serious adverse events. If you look into the details of this, it is public, you can all go into that and you can uh, you can click the English flag together in English instead of English, I guess you prefer that. You have gastrointestinal disorders, 2,412. Uh, Muscular connectivity, connectivity, connectivity tissue disorders, 2,700. Nervous system disorders, 6,084. Yet, the authorities are saying, we do not see a pattern. So maybe we should ask them to open their eyes, because the pattern is absolutely clear. They continue to say the HPV actually do not cause any side effects. Yet, we have five HPV centers have them for three years now. We have the 2,500 persons that were healthy before the vaccine, now they are very ill. We have two deaths, which they try to explain has nothing to do with the vaccine, but they are still in the statistics. Wonder why? So we have the same statement again and again and again. The HPV vaccine is safe and effective. And I, I quote that this statement is without any evidence. So when you realize that no one will help you, except a few doctors that will Luckily, we'll meet later today. Uh, but in 2013, there wasn't any HPV center, there was any, wasn't anything. So, we have to do something ourselves. So, in June 2013, we went to a uh, conference on autism to learn how uh, environmental factors can influence on chronic diseases. We met with one of the professors who helped us a lot in, in the treatment here. Later on, in July, we went to Switzerland with two Danish girls who had again a very detailed examination by different doctors to kind of figure out what is wrong here and what can we do to increase their condition. So first one uh, was a lymphocyte test. And what is interesting is these two girls got the vaccine two, three years before this date. And this negative control is actually just to make sure that the blood cells is alive. And the staff came out and said, hey, there's something wrong here. We just took the blood out of the, 
one from two girls. This number is wrong. I mean, we have never seen anything that high. So what we do, we need to recalibrate the entire setup, take in another patient to see if everything is working. So they did that and took blood once again for the two girls. Both of them had this exploding high level here. So the immune system was simply, simply overstimulated. What's that? It's the T cells count per minute. <laughs> so later on, the same two girls went to uh, to Germany and had a very detailed examination again with much more lab tests, uh, including cytokine tests, uh, mineral status, vitamin status, uh, all things that could relate to the uh, defects in the immune system. Including mitochondrial activity as well. <coughs> and then it takes a couple of months. Then you get the feedback from the professor that investigated all this. And, and this is probably basic immunology. But getting a picture from all the tests to something that you can use for treatment is a bit complicated. And the treatment uh, proposals for the two girls were different, so they were individualized. Depending on the results as well. So, what is this? Actually, you have the cytokine uh, test going in as, as one factor. You have the balance between TH1 and TH2. And you have the result of the uh, lymphocyte test. So, now the stage to start the treatment for the two girls is. None of them fail, they faint in this one. For the one I know best, which is my daughter, fainting actually stopped with the less than two weeks after we started treatment against fainting. She fainted like 50 times from July 11. She never fainted before, and now since March 20, 2014, she never fainted again. So, just after the HPV vaccine, you have this uh, frequent fainting, and then you can treat it, and then it's gone, and it's not related to the vaccine. It's a coincidence. The paralysis, what happened was you actually walk on the street, sit in a chair everywhere, and then there was just no connection from head to down. She couldn't move her legs, she couldn't feel anything. And the treatment went on for like five or six weeks, and she hasn't had these paralysis ever since. Very positive. Then in January 15, we sent it uh, samples for, for testing once again. And we didn't actually say anything to the professor that was going to, to make the post for the other treatment. So we got the result back and we asked uh, our daughter, what is, what is the most dominant symptom you have? Well, I'm always so tired. I mean, I, when I go back from school, I have to sleep. So that must be the worst as it is now, since I don't think anymore. And then what came back was actually a treatment against the chronic fatigue. It was a 10, 10 weeks treatment plan, and I tend to say to my daughter, we should have stopped after five weeks. Because she's so active now, she's full-time in school, she has two jobs after school, uh, she's partying way too much. For uh, this, as a father, you have to deal with it, I'm quite confident. And the other girl has had another treatment, uh, and this actually been the same since the full time school, actually, they're still in another country now. So, there is thing, one thing you can do about it. It's not easy, and it's probably not the same you can do with all of them. It would be easier, at least these two girls, for example, that you can have individual treatment, and then you can recover, not 100%, but to a level where you have a normal life compared to this disability life you have when you just lay in your bed. These are the results before and after treatment uh, of the T cell reaction to uh, to calcium. So what you see is, which we can give you here, the red one was before treatment, and that was three years after vaccination, and the green ones is twelve months later, meaning four years after the vaccination. So the level has definitely gone down, and the condition of the patient increased according to this. The 
this guy's uh, responsible. Well, why should we prove that? It's not our job. The manufacturer should do that. The manufacturer should prove that it is not harm done by the ISA. The symptoms, as Peter said, they are equal to the symptoms from the clinical trials and from the product in them. So how can the authorities say it's not related to the vaccine? The symptoms appear first time after the HPV vaccine. There's a strong lymphocyte reaction to Gardasil. So what we have to do now is we should work together for treatment. Thank you for your attention.